If you imagine your biology like a trip to the game reserve, there's always lots to see. But a lot more attention is paid to high sugar and high cholesterol, while insulin levels are largely ignored. The focus is on the big five. Big bellies, high cholesterol and high triglycerides, high sugar levels, and high blood pressure. Now don't get me wrong, they bring problems with a capital P. But most of the time, the reason they're high is you've got high insulin. Now in someone who's metabolically healthy, insulin rises following a meal, but drops back down and stays down once the meal has been processed. This is not what happens in the metabolically challenged. Insulin levels are high all the time, including at night. And it's the high at night that is the most problematic because this is when insulin should be sleeping and your body should be running the rest and repair programs. Insulin makes this very hard to do because you see insulin is a go and grow hormone. Repairs just aren't his priority. So step number one in improving high sugar, high cholesterol and high blood pressure is to lower insulin levels, especially at night. Now, if you're thinking, well, that's what my anti-diabetic drugs do, right? No. At this stage, at least, there's no pill you can swallow to do this. In fact, most of the pills do the opposite they increase insulin levels. This makes them pretty good at lowering sugar levels, but they never actually fix the body chemistry. This is why type 2 diabetes seldom improves. It's a slow slide to the grave. To actually lower your insulin levels, you'll have to use biology. Join us with this episode of Better Body Chemistry TV as we recap the current options available to you to lower your insulin and discover a new strategy which is easy to apply. Better Body Chemistry TV is brought to you by Dr. Sandy, a scientist turned gremlin buster helping you battle sugar gremlins, heifer lumps and other health horribles through Better Body Chemistry. Remember, small things can make a big difference to your health. The biologically based tactics to lower insulin hinge on creating a situation where less insulin is needed. The first and most obvious way to do this is with a low carb diet, since the big signal for insulin to put in an appearance is the presence of sugar. If you can lower the amount of sugar doing the rounds, you automatically lower insulin. Intermittent fasting does the same thing. When there's no food coming in, insulin levels are going to be lower because beta cells get time off. A third way to lower the levels of insulin needed is to exercise, because exercising muscles take up more sugar. So less insulin is needed. Now, all of these ideas concentrate on lowering insulin secretion. But the reason insulin levels are high is not always because the beta cells of the pancreas are trigger happy. A lot of the time, the liver is not removing the insulin at the rate that it should. Ideally, 50 to 80% of insulin should be stopped by the liver. Problems with clearance means, well, more insulin does the rounds. And this situation creates some gnarly chemistry. And the upshot of this is less insulin does what insulin does in the liver. So what does insulin do in the liver? Lots. There are two particularly important tasks. One is to help signal the liver to stop making sugar. Now, there are other players involved, and it's the fail in this signaling system that is the reason why people with type 2 diabetes manage to have sky-high sugar levels despite eating nothing. Here is a video which explains more about this. The other important thing that 
insulin does is to signal to the liver to stop making fatty acids by discouraging fatty acid synthetase activity via via. You see, insulin activates three transcription factors, SHREP, TREP, and LXR. These guys form the team of transcription factors that turn free fatty acids into esterified fats that are then shipped out of the liver to meet energy requirements. Basically, insulin is putting away the groceries and his prime directive is to put away sugars. If there are excess sugars, he wants them to be handled. And, and since the liver can turn sugars into fats, the switch off of fatty acid synthesis in the liver directs the liver to process the sugars into fats and then to ship them out, hopefully. Unfortunately, when there is metabolic snafus, the fat doesn't always leave the building. It accumulates inside the hepatocytes and gets up to all sorts of mischief. We call this hepatic insulin resistance. So, is there a way to improve insulin clearance? Well, up until now, not really. But recently, a team of researchers based at the Yale Pediatric Obesity Clinic stumbled upon a way to improve insulin clearance. They made the discovery when they were trying to figure out how to help obese youngsters battling fatty liver disease. They were particularly interested in following up what happened in kids with a specific version of, of the PNPLA3 gene. The variant they were interested in is the most common variant of the gene. They already knew that this version of the gene is associated with fatty liver disease in adolescents. So they put a group of obese youngsters on a special diet. Now, in the diet, calories were not cut. This was deliberate. Our team didn't want weight loss to muddy the waters of their findings. What they did change was to drastically lower the levels of omega-6 in the kids' diet. They took the ratio from 15 to 1 down to 4 to 1. This might sound quite extreme, but it's precisely the diet we used to consume about 100 years ago before we worried about heart healthy fats and ate real food. Now, the diet was not a low-carb diet. Carb levels came in at 50 to 55% of the daily total calories. The fats made up 25 to 30%. And the fat component included saturated and unsaturated fats. The kids got food parcels packed with kid-friendly items, such as pizza and burgers, that had had the ratio doctored. Twelve weeks later, fatty livers were better. Each dot represents one kid. The liver fat content was down in the vast majority of participants, with a few exceptions. And all the RS38409 carriers were responders. And this translated into other metabolic improvements. Most notably, insulin levels were down after meals and at midnight. Remember, what happens at midnight really matters. This finding sparked a return to the lab to work out why the insulin had dropped. The team took another look at the samples they had collected, adding C-peptide levels to the mix of data. Armed with the additional parameter, they crunched the numbers. The insulin kinetic studies showed the insulin drop was due to improved insulin clearance. It seems the so-called heart-healthy fats are poisoning the well. Now exactly how they're doing it will need to be worked out. But if you're insulin resistant, you need to sit up and take notice and work at reducing the omega-6 levels in your diet. It's actually quite easy to do. Avoid those so-called heart-healthy fats when cooking and cut out processed foods because these fats form the basis of processed foods. Need more science to make this shift in your diet? Visit the Vegetable Oils page on the Better Body Chemistry blog to unpack more of the science so that you can begin the journey today to creating better body chemistry and better health. Speaking of science, here is the journal article today's story is based on. 
know someone who is in metabolic trouble, share this video with them so they can begin to use biology to get their insulin levels under control. And if this is your first time here, be sure to subscribe to our channel so you catch future episodes of Better Body Chemistry TV. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Remember, small things can make a big difference to your health.